Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George, and today we're going to talk about why change as a basic universal process makes free will impossible. Okay, before we get into that, you know, I just want to talk briefly about, you know, the importance of the show, why this show matters. Basically, you know, our civilization, our entire, like, mindset, um, you know, our, our personal lives, they're all... They're all founded on this idea, this kind of perspective that that we we as human beings can choose whatever we want to choose. You know that we have a free will, um, and you know, unfortunately, the problem is that we don't. And so that um, you know, apart from kind of like just it being we seeing like reality, you know, completely contrary to the way it is. You know, I think when we when we believe in free will, it, it causes problems both in our personal lives and societally. Okay, um, so hopefully, you know, like by by our understanding that our wills are causal and not free, we can hopefully create a better world, a world that's more compassionate uh, towards ourselves, towards each other. Okay, um, now these shows are online at causalconsciousness.com or you can Google Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. It should show up on the first page of um, search results. And, all right, and again, before I get into the topic, I just want to go a little bit more into what we generally mean when we say that you know, we have a free will. Basically, we mean that, you know, that our thoughts are completely up to us. There's nothing compelling us to decide what we do, you know, whether it's like, you know, what we eat, what we say, what, um, what kind of work we do, you know, everything. I mean, like, basically, the idea of free will is like, all that is completely up to us. And naturally, the idea is that, well, you know, we have an unconscious that, that's always active. And the, the basic reason why we don't have a free will is, is this idea or process of cause and effect, and this show is going to be a lot about that, but essentially it's that um, everything that happens in the world, including our decisions, has a cause. Okay, that's the key. So what happens is if every, everything has a cause, then whatever causes us to make a decision will have a cause. And then there's a cause to that cause, and then there's a cause to that cause, and a cause to that cause, and the causes will always come, you know, in the past in terms of events. Like, you know, a cause can never come, you know, in the future. You know, it's always cause and effect. So naturally, if we have this chain of cause and effect, the effect that leads back further and further into the past, then we can see how, you know, the the causes that ultimately led up to any kind of decision we might make were made long before we were born, long before um, the planet um, was created. So in a certain sense, I mean, like, you know, sometimes the idea that we don't have a free will, you know, um, leads people to believe, well, we're robots, we're puppets. And in a sense, we are, but like, you know, we don't have to, like, see it that way. We could see it that, um, that God, okay, is in control of everything. God, you know, God created the world. God is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's om omnipresent. And so we're kind of like the instruments of God, you know, like um, we're kind of like expressing in a physical way what God is and what, what God does. Okay, so that's, you know, that's a lot more palatable to people than, than thinking of ourselves as robots or, and, and we're certainly, some people say, well, we, we, that, you know, because we don't have free will, we're, we're zombies. Now, I just like, I learned, I didn't know what a zombie meant, but I learned, I guess, about three weeks ago or so. A zombie, I think, is somebody who, like, gets raised up out of the dead and just walks around, I don't know. But no, that's, that's a completely different idea. You know, we're, we're robots, we're kind of like computers, we're programmed, whatever. Or, you know, we're actors, um, or again, we're instruments of God. All right, so let's, let's get to the topic. Um, all right, the idea is the first fact of existence, that this is undeniable, it's a priori, priori, it's, it's axiomatic. The universe exists, okay? Everything, everything exists. I mean, there is existence. We are here. The universe exists, all right? Um, unarguable. You know, you can't argue that. 
The second a priori fact, axiomatic, you can't argue it, is that the basic process in the universe is change. Okay, think about that. I mean, if, if, the, if the universe didn't have change, then everything would be completely frozen. Okay, there would, I wouldn't be doing this show. I wouldn't be talking. You wouldn't be watching. You know, planets wouldn't be turning around. You know, like our planet wouldn't be revolving around the sun or rotating on its axis. You know, if there was not change, nothing would move. You know, so, so there would not be a world as we know it now. Okay, so, uh, so again, we have a priori knowledge that the universe exists and a priori knowledge that um, the fundamental process of the universe is change. So, now, when you think of change, what is change? Um, change is something, a state, let's take the entire universe, um, moving from one state to another. Change is like a particle being at, um, at one point at one time and then at another point in the next time. You know, that's what change is. Change is that, you know, it's basically, essentially, when you think about it, it's matter moving through space in time. Okay, so that, so that basically, um, basically, you know, at one moment you'll have, um, you know, a particle or something at a certain point, you know, then like at the next moment because of change and momentum, these laws of physics, it'll be at, at the next point. That's change. Okay, so again, two axiomatic facts. Um, now, the, um, what, what pulls this all together and what, 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 um, what kind of like just makes free will impossible is the idea that in order for change to take place, there has to be causality. And, and as, as a matter of fact, causality is the process that allows for change. No change could ever happen without causality. Um, there's a statement to, to the effect that nothing can be causa sui, meaning the cause of itself, unless perhaps we want to consider the, let's say, God, you know, as the first cause, as the cause of, of himself, herself, whatever. But after that, you know, every other cause has to have a prior cause. Okay, so if you have causality, cause and effect, as the process that is required for any change to take place in the universe, um, you can understand how um, causality is really as axiomatic as, um, as the fact that there is a universe and the fact that the universe changes. And I say this to kind of like to clarify, you know, confusion that, that has um, arisen in physics since 1927, I believe, when um, Werner Heisenberg, Heisenberg um, published his um, Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. And we're going to, I'm not going to get into this too much now because I'm going to do a, a separate show on it. But basically, you know, it was a, um, a mathematical equation that demonstrates that you can't at the same time measure the position and the momentum of a particle. Okay, if you, if you measure, I mean, with, 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 um, with precision. You know, if you, if you measure the particle's position, then its momentum becomes less clear. If you meant measure the particle's momentum, then its position becomes less clear. Okay, that's the basic uncertainty principle, and it applies to other things like particle spin, particle charge, particle phase, and stuff. And, you know, again, I'll go into that on another show. But that is, for some reason, it, it, it just it doesn't make sense, really, but it, that led people, physicists, um, basically this guy Niels Bohr and Werner um, Heisenberg, who, who formed what's known as the Copenhagen Interpretation of Quantum Physics, because this is basically explaining um, reality at the level of subatomic particles, the quantum level, and it led them to conclude that since we can't measure simultaneously, you know, position or momentum or two what they call conjugate variables, you know, like spin, uh, charge, and all that, since we can't do that, somehow these processes are uncaused. And so that's, that's why it's important to see that if the universe exists 
is an axiomatic fact and change is axiomatic, you know, to, because like, you know, otherwise everything would be frozen. Then if causality is necessary, describes change, obviously causality is a fund, fundamental fact of nature that, um, that uh, this, this, in other words, this explanation of causality uh, um, is at a much more fundamental level than, than interpreting, you know, the results of the Heisenberg, <coughs> excuse me, uncertainty principle. I mean, there's more to it. I mean, it's just, it's never been shown in any way that something could ever be uncaused. I mean, think about it. Okay, uh, so, so let's see. So change requires causality, okay? And this can be demonstrated, like, through certain laws of physics. <coughs> um, for example, there's a law of conservation of mass energy that's a little confusing. Um, mass energy has never been violated. There's, like, the idea is, like, when one particle interacts with another particle, there's an exchange of mass energy. One particle is going to like gain mass energy, another is going to lose it. And that's really never been violated. That's the cross, you know. So the, uh, the idea is like, you know, if one particle gains mass energy, then the cause of that gain has to be the, the interaction with the other particle. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's clear as, as day. Um, the problem with that law is that um, when you separate it into like, you know, because mass energy is what Einstein kind of like explained the universe as in, in his theories of, of relativity. I'm not sure if it was special or general, but it's the idea that like mass and energy are, are actually one. E equals mc squared. You know, that's what that's about. So, um, but that gets a little confusing because like apparently, and you know, I kind of ha have some doubts about this, but apparently there, there have been some seeming violations of conservation of mass and some seeming violations of con conservation of energy that, um, that, that make this law a bit less clear. But there's another law in physics, another conservation law. The conservation laws basically came out of Newton's um, laws of motion, you know, I think back in the 1500s, whatever. And this, this is conservation of momentum. Now, the idea is like every particle, like when a particle is moving through space, it has momentum. Momentum is like velocity and direction. You know, so like so the, the, the idea is like, yeah, when, um, when a particle is at one point, its momentum at one point is going to determine its momentum at the second point. You can never, like, lose momentum. And if, if, if a particle interacts with another one, momentum is always conserved. It can never be dissipated. You know, it could, you can never lose momentum. So anyway, so that, <laughs> that um, the idea that we have this conservation of, of momentum, that conservation of momentum requires causality, is another proof at the most fundamental level of physics that causality, you know, is the process for change, is the basic process of, of how things happen. Okay, um, another law of physics that I think it's obvious to us all, and again, Einstein's relativity confuses this a bit, but it's, um, I mean, he gets it right, but it's just like it's very not intuitive the way he explains it. Um, the idea is that, um, Matter moves through space in time, okay? Time is, is what, what allows for change. If there was no time, there could be no change, right? So you have like a particle at one point at a certain moment in time, and th since everything is moving, um, it's going to be at another moment, uh, point, the next moment in time. And, um, and this movement, you know, applies to every particle on Earth, because you have, to, you have to realize that, like, well, first of all, the universe is expanding. So our, our whole solar system, galaxy, Milky Way galaxy, is expanding outward. The galaxy is expanding toward something called the Great Attractor Anomaly or something like that, a region of the universe. And, um, and our solar system is moving in time, revolving around the, the Milky Way galaxy. And so, like, basically there's a lot of kinds of motions that are always happening and that, that would include every particle, every, every part of, of the Earth. So, but that, it requires time, okay? Time is, um, is what allows change, what allows causality to happen. And another axiom I would 
say in physics, although um, some may disagree, is that there is an arrow of time that in a sense that like time will only go from past to present to future. It'll never go from future to present to past. Okay, and uh, the reason I say that's axiomatic is, is because, well, there's, there's never been a known violation. You know, in physics, there are certain kinds of theories, certain kinds of equations that are deemed um, symmetrical in the sense that they allow mathematically for time to travel backward. But, I mean, when you think of these kinds of equations and, and, and theories, you have to remember that mathematics is a measuring tool. It's not a descriptor of reality. I mean, it helps the physicists to come up with measurements of reality to then, you know, reach their conclusions. So, for example, um, with mathematics, you can have, you can subtract two from one and get a negative one, okay? That, everybody understands that, you know, from, from just simple mathematics, whatever. But, you know, that doesn't mean that you can subtract two apples from one apple and get a physical entity, you know, that is a negative apple, okay? Negative apples do not exist, okay? So that's why I say that, uh, um, that even though there are equations that, that allow for time to go backwards, it's just the math, it's never been demonstrated. So we have this arrow of time, and here's the thing. Okay, sometimes one of the, um, one of the claims for free will is that, well, you know, our mind is not physical. You know, our thoughts are not physical. So that, um, so, you know, people say, well, if our thoughts are not physical, then that means that maybe they're not caused. That means that maybe they're like the result of our free will. And, and the problem with that is time. In other words, like, let's say we make uh, a decision and we call it quote-unquote spiritual, you know, that it, it doesn't have a physical presence. And that, again, that defies logic, but let's, let's assume that. Well, that decision would have to take place within a moment in time. It has a precise position in this timeline that goes from past to present to future. And naturally, if it has a precise moment in, that, in this timeline, it is completely subject to the causality that governs everything else, the cause and effect. Um, a good way to understand this is let's, let's say we make a decision, we define it as freely willed, spiritual, whatever, but it's got, you know, it happens in the present moment. Okay, we have to realize the present moment, anything that happens in, in the present moment is the complete result of the state of the universe at the moment, moment previous. Okay, that's, you know, when we talk about cause and effect, that's the most complete description of causality possible. That it's the state of the universe prior to anything that determines it, that is the cause. And naturally, you know, if we, we have this, like, spiritual decision, um, taking place at a set point in time and then like being caused by the state of the universe at the moment before, then that state of the universe is caused by the state of the universe before that and that state is caused by the state of the universe before that. And again, you have this regression, this causal regression that leads back to the Big Bang and who knows what happened before that. So, so anyway, that's the idea is that like defining decisions, our will, our mind as you know, not being physical does not help the argument for free will because, you know, again, um, any, any decision we make, any thought we have, has a specific point in time, and time is, um, is causal. Okay. Um, I just want to go into this idea of randomness, of indeterminism. Um, it's 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 mind-bogglingly perplexing how how um, how you know otherwise very brilliant people have you know have you know proposed this um, this hypothesis. The idea is some physicists and 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 my personal guess is that you know these a lot of these physicists like Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, they weren't just physicists. They were interested in the fundamental nature of reality, and I'm sure they. Um, they um, kind of like had an interest in this question of whether the, the human will is free or not. 
So, and, and that's what I, what I think kind of like leads people to make, you know, these kinds of like conclusions that are just like, they're just internally in, inconsistent, they're incoherent, they just make no sense. The idea is like randomness, okay? Now, sometimes we understand randomness as, um, as you know, you just like, you have a deck of cards, pick a card at random, okay? That's, that's like apparent randomness. And because I say that because like, what, what some people mean, what these physicists <laughs> mean, um, and what's actually taught in most um, phys physics textbooks um, at the college level that, that's beginning to change, you know, based on this Copenhagen interpretation that says that things aren't caused, is that, that things happen at random. Um, but the reality is that, like, you know, think about the concept of randomness, of something happening that's not caused. It doesn't make sense. There, you know, there's a cause to everything, okay? Things don't just like, I mean, because think about it. Let's say something just happened, okay? Like, let's say a particle, you know, came out of nowhere. Okay, well, still, you know, that particle is there the moment before it wasn't. That's a causal process. You can't say that that was random. And it's interesting because, like, one of the, um, one of the, um, a lot of times <laughs> the physicists and other scientists, they say to themselves, well, I know everything that's happening in this system. I know everything that's happening, like for example, with radioactive decay. They can't, you know, for, a, for a, a, an isotope that has a half-life, that you know, they'll, it'll decay at a certain amount of time. They can't predict exactly when a single particle will decay. Okay, they can't predict that. Um, and so, like, for years and years and years, they've said, well, since we can't predict it, it can't have a cause. It can't be random. And, you know, I, ho I hope you can understand the illogic of that. But the reason I'm bringing this up now is because there was actually a, a study done by a couple of um, professors at Stanford and Purdue that was published, I think, last September, October, that actually, you know, they had thought this radioactive decay was completely random, uncaused and all, and all of a sudden they find a correlation between activity on the sun and seasonal changes in the rate of um, radioactive decay. So the idea is like there, there have been various processes in physics and in nature where I think it's an, an, um, scientific arrogance that leads certain scientists to say, well, we know everything that's happening here and since we can't predict behavior, it must be random. And so, like, what happens in history, there have been cases like that, and I've got to do some research on it because they don't come to mind um, right now. But what happens is that um, in those cases, later, it might be a decade later, like, you know, several decades later, like this thing with radioactive decay, they find, oh, there, there are causes. You know, we, we didn't see everything. So that's, so the idea is that, like, there is no randomness. There's, there's no thing, everything has to be caused, okay? There's, you know, um, another, another way how, how this got confused was, like, this guy, Simon Laplace, um, very famous mathematician. I think he was a phys physicist also. Um, he came up with the statement of determinism. He said, if we had like, um, if we knew the position of, of every particle in the universe, and um, with that knowledge, if we could like compute it, we, we could know both the past and the present. Nothing would be hidden from us. And what confused people is that because of this Heisenberg uncertainty principle, because we can't, you know, um, know the position and momentum of a particle simulta simultaneously. And even beyond that, because we can't know everything in the universe, we can't naturally predict everything in the universe with, with precision. But that led people to believe that um, in such a thing as indeterminism, which really can be defined as randomness at, or chance. And again, e the way, whatever term you want to use, randomness, indeterminism, chance, Basically, what they're saying is that things are uncaused, okay? And um, sometimes people define randomness as unpredictability, but that's kind of like a, a sleight of hand because then when you ask them what unpredictability is, it's as well, it's not caused, whatever. At least that's what um, the physicists um, will say. So, um, all right. So, again, now bringing this back to free will. If if the universe exists axiomatically, if 
you know, call a change is the fundamental process in the universe without which nothing could happen. You know, there'd be no movement. And if causality is necessary to all change, then causality is the fundamental process in nature. And so if you have everything having a cause, which that's what it means, that means every one of our decisions has a cause, and, you know, that cause has a cause, and that cause has a cause, and that, that is the way, that's the best way, perhaps, to understand why free will is impossible. I'm not really sure it's actually the best way, because recently I've been thinking about the idea that we have an unconscious. We have an, you know, an entire part of our, our mind, our brain, that, um, that we're not aware of. But like, for example, every time I'm, I'm saying something, these words, these words I'm using, I'm not taking these from, from my conscious mind because my conscious mind couldn't store all these words and concepts and all that, you know, because, you know, literally that have, I'd have to be conscious of them all the time and that's not possible. So they're all stored in the unconscious and like if we have this unconscious that we have to draw on and we're not in control of the unconscious, that's kind of like the definition, that's a good way to understand, um, I think, more intuitively how, um, how free will is impossible. All right. Um, I hope, I hope that this has kind of like, you know, clarified um, to the idea that, that everything has a cause and, and, and this, this idea of causality is fundamental to nature. You can't escape it and that's why we don't have a free will. All right, so thanks for watching. In the future, we're going to explore many other ways of understanding why free will is impossible, it's an illusion, and why it matters to the world. Okay, so uh, I'll see you next time.